the Prophecy Club. I've got Steve Henderson on the phone with me again today, and we're going to be talking about the rapture. Well, who's Steve Henderson? He's been studying Bible prophecy for about 25 years, pastor, evangelist, equipper, apologist. I think he's got some real important information about the rapture today. So, Steve, welcome back to the Prophecy Club. Stan, thank you for your invitation. Okay, so is it pre, mid, pre-wrath, or post? Whatever you want to label it, it's very clear to me in Scripture that this is a day of preparation. In my estimation, from all of the years that I have studied Bible prophecy, I believe that the pre-trib rapture is the doctrine of the unprepared. As a black belt fighter, I fought in many years in the ring, and I recognized that before I went in the ring, I had to do a great preparation. I had to run wind sprints. I had to uh, run miles. I put weights on my hands and feet. In 1976, I was a middleweight champion fighter in Korea, first foreigner in Korea to win a Korean title. And I didn't get there just by thinking about things and having concepts about getting in the ring. What I can find in the prophetic word is there is a time when we're going to get in the ring. And we better be very, very prepared, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually most of all. And this doctrine of pre-trib rab propagates that one day before this trouble comes, they're going to be leaving the earth, and then some, depending on their theology, will be seven years or three and a half years raptured away, and then the wicked will be left here to suffer great wrath and tribulation for that amount of time. I do not see that in the scriptures. Let's go to the one that they used most of all, found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. 16 and 17. Yes. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now please note, at the same time, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In my discussions with many people that uh, propagate the pre-trib rapture, they use this particular scripture. Now, I remember watching the Left Behind movie one time. According to the Bible, it's so diametrically opposed to the concept that one day the people of God just leave off the earth, and then the, the, the wicked are left here for a while. You know, you look around, your wife is gone, people fall out of planes, and it's in a secret way. No one knows about it. You just wake up and your wife's gone. You're looking around for your wife, you can't find her. But according to this, when uh, Yeshua comes down, he will descend from heaven with a shout. And that sounds that's a, quite an audible thing, I believe. And with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet. And when that trumpet blows, he's descending the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and at the same time, the dead are coming up out of the ground, which is the first resurrection. Blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection, upon which the second death has no power. So there will be two specific resurrections, and at the time of the blowing of the trumpet, the dead are going to be raised out of the ground. We will not perceive those which are coming out of the ground, that's what's found in verse 15. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so we will ever be with the Lord. Now, I would like to take a look at another section of Scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to take a look at this trumpet for a moment, because I believe it's the seventh trumpet or the last trumpet according to this verse in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Now, here is that trumpet again that we find found over in the, the, to the church at Thessalonica. He's saying the same thing here. They're sleeping. They're going to be raised up out of the ground. It says that at that time that trumpet sounds, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So I see uh, those who are dead and those who are alive, they're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Nowhere here does it show that the dead are being raised uh, seven years before tribulation here. It's at the last trumpet. And when the dead are raised, that is when 
we which are alive or remain will be caught up. And they use this word caught up as the symbolism for what they refer to as rapture, which is the Greek word harpazo, and there is a parousia here too. But there are actually three or four different words that they separate. One is epiphany, one is parousia, one is apocalypsis, and then this is harpazo. And when you do a study, sometimes in the scripture you'll find both in the same verse. And so they're trying to pick and choose their words here. The word caught up simply means that we are going to be brought up in the air to meet the dead uh, at, the, at the last trump. Now, we find this over in Matthew chapter 24 again, and let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 24, we find this trumpet being blown again. And let's take a look at verse 29. There will be a lot of signs that will take place. And as Jesus gave signs about his return, he said there are going to be a lot of things that are going to take place uh, that you need to be able to see. And in verse 15 of 24, he talks about the abomination of desolation. When you see it, it implies that you're going to see this, and not, you're not going to be out of here, but you're going to see something. And then he ties it in, verse 21, to a great tribulation, such as ever was. And then he gives a warning for uh, those who are false prophets and false, false Christ that show great signs and wonders. And he said, Behold, if you're in a desert, verse 26, don't go forth, or if he's in, they say he's in secret chambers, believe it not. So evidently, he's given a warning, uh, and it implies to me that the saints are going to be here, and he's given a warning against believing these people. But then when you go down to verse 29, it clearly says that immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now listen, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is not going to be something secret. And then he shall send his angels, listen, with a great sound of a trumpet. There's that trumpet again. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So again, we find that at the time of this tribulation, it says clearly, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then he will gather his people up with a great sound of a trumpet. And he says, if they say he's in the secret chambers, don't go out there, for his lightning shines from the east to the west. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He's coming a second time without sin and salvation. Uh, if he were to come in secret, where one day you, you wake up and your wife's gone, you don't know where she's at, and it's just totally antithesis to what the, the Bible says. In my studies, I have found that many pastors and preachers say, well, brother, one will be taken and the other left. And the one that they say that is taken is the righteous before the uh, tribulation, and I see nowhere in Scripture, and I challenge anyone to show me uh, the righteous are, are leaving before the wicked. And in Luke chapter 17, we find Jesus speaking about the end, parallel um, reflection, major events that happened back in Noah's day and in Lot's day, and verse 26. Jesus likens the day when he comes to the day of Noah, and here he declares, In verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus likens this day when he comes as the days of Noah. They were marrying and given in marriage, and it sounds kind of like our our day today, that the day came upon them unaware. When Noah went into the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. So the righteous and the wicked were there at the same time. In fact, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in a day when the Son of Man is revealed. So remember what happened there in the day of Lot. Lot had tarried to the last minute when he sent angels into that wicked city to move his family out of there. 
When that happened, that same day, he brought fire and brimstone out of heaven and destroyed them. So they were both there together until the last minute, the last day. Even thus, he says, verse 30, it will be in the same way when the Son of Man is revealed. So he likens this same day thing. When Noah went in the ark, the flood came. When Sodom uh, was destroyed, he, he got Lot out of there just before the destruction. There was no indicator that Noah uh, left the earth uh, and the wicked died. When the rain came, he was there. When Lot was moved out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone that very same day. Then he says this, in that day, verse 31, which shall be upon the housetop, and if you have stuff in your house, let him don't come down to take it away. It implies that you're going to be there, that you're not going to leave, but in that day he will be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house. Let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Then he says, remember Lot's wife. But please pay attention to this next verse. This does not imply that he's going to remove uh, God's people out of this trouble, but he, in fact, says something absolutely different in this verse. In verse 33, we'll be right back after this message. In the Rob Skiba gift offer, his first DVD is Mythology, UFOs, and the Coming Great Deception. Topics are Sumerian, Egyptian, and Greek pantheons, the Coming Great Deception, UFOs and aliens, interdimensional portals, transhumanism, and the quest to be like gods, giants and hybrids, and in Babylon Rising, the topics are the signs in the heavens, Babylon in the last days, new world order conspiracies, secret societies and the occult's obsession with the numbers 322, tetrads or blood red moons in the eclipses in the days ahead, the feasts of God and how they relate to the last days, the tribulation survival plan, and 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Topics will be Genesis 6, Nephilim, hybrid humans, war with hybrids, hybrids among us, the injection of immortality, all three DVDs valued at $90, available for a gift of just $50 at prophecyclub.com. In Doug Hamp's new DVD, The Injection of the Beast, in the last days, it will be as in the days of Noah. Angels were mixing their seed with humanity, and it's happening again. That's demons and humans having sexual relations, masquerading as aliens, or actually creating Nephilim hybrids for the body of the Antichrist. Then in The Fall, Feast, and Prophecy, he tells the story of how Jesus fulfilled the first four feasts at his first coming and how he will fulfill the next three in return on some future Rosh Hashanah. The Day of Atonement pictures the opening of the books and the judgment of those dead and alive. The Feast of Tabernacles pictures us receiving our mansions. Both DVDs valued at $60 for a gift of just $40 or more in the HAMP gift offer. Remember, the Prophecy Club continues because of your prayers and gifts of support, not the distribution of DVDs. And now, back to the program. He, in fact, says something absolutely different in this verse. In verse 33, whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I see nothing here in this scripture that says that the righteous are going to be removed three and a half years or seven years before the trouble comes. In fact, he goes on to continue in verse 34. I tell you in that night, in the same time, there will be two men in one bed, and that's highly likely they, considering uh, what's going on in our country with homosexual marriage. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Brother Stan, if I tell you that there are two people standing in your door, one is going to be taken, and the other left, and two are standing in your church, one is going to be taken, and the other left, and two are in the car, one is taken, and the other left, and you ask me where... Are you asking me where is the one that's taken or where is the one that is left? Well, of course, I already know the answer. Matthew thirteen forty one 41 says, it says, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend 
and them which do iniquity. In other words, it is the sinner that is removed. Uh, Proverbs 10.30, the righteous shall never be removed. Okay, so that is an excellent, uh, excellent piece of uh, scripture you just imparted to me, brother. What I find here is he's talking about the righteous and the wicked being together. One will be taken and the other left. But the one that is taken, from all I can find in, in, in a lot of these pre-trib rapture people, they said the one that is taken is the righteous. But I propose to you that I'm not asking you where is the one that is left, because we know that he's still in a doorway, he's still in your church, and he's still in the car. But according to the answer that Jesus gave in verse 37, and they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? So the question is, where is the one that is taken? Not the one that's left. You know that the one that's left is still in the field. The one that's left is still grinding there. The one that's left is still in the bed. But the one that's taken is where he's asking about. And Jesus' answer is this. Wheresoever the body is, there the eagles or the vultures or the flesh-eating birds will be gathered together. So very evidently, the one taken is not the righteous, but the one that is taken is the wicked for judgment. When Noah got in his ark, who was taken from the earth and who was left? The ones that were taken were the sinners. Absolutely. Same thing with Lot. The ones that it, were removed was the sinners. Absolutely. See, Noah was the only one left with his family of eight, and the, and, and the, and the wicked were, were taken. So in this whole context, you find that Lot, when he went out of Sodom, he was left. The only one left out of Sodom, the rest of them were destroyed. And Jesus says very clearly here that the one that is taken are the ones where the eagles are gathered together. Now let me take you to Revelation 19 uh, and show you what he's talking about here. Revelation 19, we find a gathering together of the nations. And in this, in this time, in, contextually, where you find two groups of people, in Revelation 19, you find those who are arrayed in plain and white linen who have been prepared for the married supper of the Lamb. You find in the same scenario, Jesus coming down. According to this, we find an angel who stands in the sun, and let's look at it, Revelation 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all of the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together, unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat flesh of kings and captains, mighty men, flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, flesh of all men, free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So when Jesus said, one taken, the other left, when he answered, he said, where the body is, there the vulture is gathered together. The ones that are gathered together are gathered together here at this spot where he is inviting the fowls of the air to come to the great supper of God. Now, that is so clear to me <clears throat> that the one that is gathered is the one that is wicked. I think that this very clearly shows that the righteous and the wicked are going to be together until the heart. Absolutely. And, Let me give you a couple of scriptures as we go there. Okay. In Matthew thirteen forty one, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Matthew thirteen forty nine, so shall it be in the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, meaning the just stay, wicked go. And then, as I said, Proverbs ten thirty, the righteous shall never be removed. Absolutely, brother. It's so clear to me. When he gave this parable of the sower, the... The situation was that the Son of Man had sowed the good seed, and then the enemy came in unaware and sowed bad seed. And of course, we have recognized through the parable that the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the bad seed are the children of the evil one. The reapers came over to say, hey, uh, should we take these bad seed out of here? He said, no, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather first who? The righteous? No. It says, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Very clearly, the one that is taken and gathered are the ones that are the tares. Now, he goes on down here to explain further 
in verse 39 and 40. He says the enemy that sowed the bad seed is the devil. Now please note, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Then he says this eye-opening statement. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. He says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. So, in complimenting what you're saying here, brother, it says that the wheat and tares both grow together until the harvest. The harvest is the end. I see nowhere where the righteous are being removed three and a half years or seven years before the end. Very clearly, Jesus says this in several places in this passage of Scripture. As you noted here in verse 49, the focus is not on the righteous, but he will come and sever the wicked from among the just. The righteous and the wicked will be together. One will be taken and the other left. And the focus is not on taking the righteous and removing them out of tribulation, but that he will in fact come back after the tribulation at that last trumpet to gather his elect together from the four ends of the earth. So what I find is, is very necessary to discover here is we need to be prepared for this particular scenario that's coming upon the earth. There is going to be a great falling away, I believe a great exodus, out of Christianity I agree. because all of these false teachers and preachers have been telling their flocks, oh, don't worry about it, brother. We're going to be out of here before it happens. I recognize that deliverance is going to come in a very different way. What would be the need for the book of Revelation if you tear out Revelation 4 through uh, chapter 19? What would be the need for the warning against the mark of the beast or any of this other part of Scripture if, in fact, we will not be here? And I see something so much different than so many. I see the saints of God right in the heart of this tribulation. In Revelation chapter 7, we find that in the conclusion of the matter... <laughs> hey, let me interrupt here. We're sure. about to run out of time here. I, I love hearing you. And brothers and sisters, we're going to continue with Steve Henderson tomorrow. I do have one scripture, and that is Isaiah nine fifteen, And this is the warning, okay? So for you pre-tribbers, you folks that are teaching errors out there, knowingly teaching errors, it's real danger. It says, Isaiah nine fifteen, the ancient and honorable. He is the head. And now listen, listen to this part. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Now, what does that mean? That may mean when you get to heaven, you've lost all of your rewards, your crowns, and you are at the bottom of heaven. Though you were a prophet, it says, you are a tail. In other words, you're not the head in heaven, you'll be the tail. In heaven, because you taught lies, you'll lose all of your rewards. So just beware that we've got to make certain that we are teaching accurately when we are teaching. Benjamin Franklin said that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. In other words, if we want to believe a lie, then the devil will, of course, let us go ahead and believe that lie. But here's the scary part. Been my experience, God will too. We really have to seek hard to find the truth. Like the Bible says in other places, if you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Well, it's the same way with truth. We've got to seek truth with all of our heart because just naturally we find that we're in a pack of lies. Now, my favorite three verses to kill the pre-trib rapture are these. Now, understand, we've got lots of verses, over 20 verses, that kill the pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath rapture. But if you want to continue to believe a lie, <laughs> I can't convince you. You have to really be seeking after the truth and seeking hard after the truth, or you'll never believe, or you'll never accept, or you'll never see the truth. The truth is what you have to work to find. The lies come easy. Here it is, Job fourteen twelve. So man lieth down, as in, okay, he dies, okay? So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. In other words, Taint nobody going no place <laughs> before Jesus returns and burns up the tares. Now, let's go on to the next verse. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret 
until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. In other words, again, no one's coming out of the grave until the wrath is passed. And what is the wrath? It is not the seven-year tribulation. It's not the last three and a half years. It's not the last 100 days. The wrath is the day of the Lord. It is one evening and one morning. Exactly the definition of the wrath is this. When he blows his glory down on the earth. Then verse 14 says, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change become. What change is he talking about? He's talking about that when that glory hits us, then it is fulfilled that out of our belly will flow rivers of living water and we get our glorified body. And from that instant, we never hunger again, thirst again. We never die again. We never age again. We never sin again. Hallelujah. Now, essentially, these three verses say three things, three reasons why no one is going to get pre, mid, or pre-wrath raptured. Essentially, it says, when you go to the grave, you're not coming out of the grave until the heavens are destroyed, until the wrath is passed, and then at that time, you get your glorified body. There it is. Steve, once again, uh, hang on, brother. I want to make another program with you right after this. And for those of you out there listening, let me say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your prayers. And yes, thank you for your gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. As prophecy students, we know an emergency is heading our way. And the average person can go over 30 days without food, but no more than three days without clean water. In the event of an emergency, you must have clean water almost immediately. One of the primary causes of death in emergencies is not lack of food, but rather drinking contaminated water. You can run water from a mud puddle through a Berkey and drink it. You can have clean water when others are getting sick from drinking bug-infested water. Your filter must work without pressurized water or electricity, which is why the missionaries choose Berkey. You can get a Go Berkey for $139, but I recommend you get the Royal Berkey with four filters for $364. I personally use the Crown with eight filters for all my daily water needs. A Royal Berkey looks like a large stainless steel coffee pot, nine inches wide by 20 inches tall, with four black filters. It processes over a gallon an hour for a gift of $364. Call 785-266-1112. Ask for the Royal Berkey, 785-266-1112, or the Crown Berkey with eight filters. Or see the entire line of Berkeys by going to prophecyclub.com. In the Rob Skiba gift offer, his first DVD is Mythology, UFOs, and the Coming Great Deception. Topics are Sumerian, Egyptian, and Greek pantheons, the Coming Great Deception, UFOs and Aliens, Interdimensional Portals, Transhumanism, and the Quest to Be Like Gods, Giants and Hybrids, and in Babylon Rising, the topics are The Signs in the Heavens, Babylon in the Last Days, New World Order Conspiracies, Secret Societies, and the Occult's Obsession with the Numbers 322, Tetrads, or Blood Red Moons, in the Eclipses in the Days Ahead, The Feasts of God and How They Relate to the Last Days, The Tribulation Survival Plan, and 2045, The Year Man Becomes Immortal. Topics will be Genesis 6, Nephilim, Hybrid Humans, War with Hybrids, Hybrids Among Us, The Injection of Immortality, all three DVDs valued at $90, available for a gift of just $50 at prophecyclub.com. There are 30 scriptures in the Bible which say in the last days, massive amounts of oil will be discovered in Israel, and we believe we've been given the directive to use this prophesied oil and gas to fund worldwide soul winning. If you have questions about our vision, call 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772.